Well, good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. We are so pleased to be together, one in the body of Christ, here to worship the Lord this morning. Let us begin our time of worship with prayer. Almighty God, our Father, dwelling in majesty and mystery, renewing and fulfilling creation by your eternal spirit, cleanse us from doubt and fear, enable us to worship you with your Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, living and reigning now and forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of James, beginning in chapter 5, verse 13. Let us listen to the word of God. Are any among you suffering? 
they should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Well, pretty long ago now, when I was in seminary, one of the internships that we had to do was to be a chaplain. And I wound up as the chaplain at an in-home hospice in the Milwaukee area. It was a really neat and meaningful experience, and there were patients who would come there from so many backgrounds that I learned a great deal during this internship. It was also really the first time I ever actually faced a a fair amount of resistance to the idea that I was a female clergy person. It was my job each day to go around the hospice center and to meet with the patients and to listen to their fears and their hopes and their pains, to meet with their families and to pray with all of them. I spent a good deal of time studying what to do if the patient was non-religious or anti-religious, but still needed a place to talk and a shoulder to release their fears about death on. And I was set for all of that. I was set for all the different ways I should share God's love with actions and not perhaps with the usual pastoral methods. What I wasn't ready for was Jerry. Jerry was very strong-willed and very sick. And I had previously been under the assumption that when you are very sick, you let go of some of the boundaries and the beliefs that have kept you separated from other faithful people of different denominations or different details of religious belief. Because as death approaches, the big picture means that you desire prayer from anyone, anytime, and that you desire assurances of God's love and promise of eternal life from anyone at any time. Not Jerry. When I think of my time working at the hospice house that summer, many of the details have faded over the years, but what remains clear in my mind is that Jerry had no use for a female chaplain. I would ask if he would like prayer, and he would say no in such a vehement way. It was truly as if he thought his chance at the hereafter would be tainted by my presence on his spiritual path. At first, I tried not to let it bother me, to tell myself it was his faith, his upbringing, and quite frankly, it was his choice what to do with his final days. But as the weeks went on, I did feel a little hurt by his objections to my presence. But things were going well with other residents, and so while I dutifully stopped by Jerry's room, I tried to spend more time and more energy on others who were more receptive to prayer and to visits. Then one day, Stephen moved in down the hall from Jerry. The nurses told me that Stephen was a lifelong Christian and was very anxious to have prayer with the chaplain's staff. I was always wanting to be helpful, so I was thrilled, and I headed off down the hall to visit. And when I arrived, he was hooked up to a dialysis machine, a place he would often be tethered for his final weeks, and he was reading the paper. When I entered the room, we exchanged the usual polite introductions, and I began to engage the spiritual process I was used to offering, but he seemed in a great hurry to get back to his paper. 
So I said a quick prayer, and he returned to his routine. That day, I figured he was still settling in or not feeling well, but each day that I was there brought the same. A devotion to the news from Stephen and a total lack of interest from Jerry. I was really starting to wonder about my potential for ministry in the future. We had eight guests in hospice, and two of them did not appear to care for me. And one day I must have showed a little disappointment on my face when Stephen told me it was time for him to get back to his paper. And he caught my look and glanced up at me and said, Do you read the paper? I said I try to keep up, but I certainly don't read it as faithfully as you do. And then he began to share. He'd been a churchgoer all his life, had done all of the traditional church activities, men's groups and leadership roles and building care. And then one day he found himself old and sick, and he couldn't do anything for his church anymore, or so he thought. And he became depressed, and all he wanted was to zone out of his earthly fragility and feelings of uselessness by reading the paper. It kept his mind occupied, he said, and it passed the lonely hours. It was breaking his heart that he couldn't make a difference anymore, he thought, until one day. One day he realized that his pastor drew the prayers of the people from the newspaper And if the pastor could use a newspaper to encourage prayer, why couldn't he? And in that moment, he found his mission. Each day, he faithfully read and reread that paper. He prayed over each situation, each geographical area, each reporter, each everything. He prayed. Even tethered to a dialysis machine, he had found a way to change the world. And although he appreciated all the kindness of the staff at hospice, he said he didn't know how long he had left, and he really wanted to keep making a difference. I left the room stunned. Praying through a newspaper was not a new idea to me, but the passion and the power and the true sense of calling, this fervent attitude was absolutely inspiring. I still get goosebumps thinking about it. He really didn't need much from me. His faith was strong, his purpose was clear, and he talked with God all day as he flipped those pages. Stephen passed away over Labor Day weekend that summer. And I wasn't the chaplain on call, and I didn't have the honor of praying with him and with his family at the last. I came back to work on Tuesday, and I was just crushed that he wasn't there for even our short visits anymore. That week, I went to visit Jerry, and by this time, Guard up and disappointment ready as usual, the most incredible thing happened. Jerry said to me, you know, I guess you're not trying to serve me communion or anything. It would be okay if you said a little prayer. I just about fell over. I sat with him, I held his hand, and we prayed. And after I said amen... I looked up hoping that he was as moved as I was by the experience, by knowing that God, who is bigger than all of our boxes, had broken through and brought peace and love into that room and into his heart. And he looked at me and he said, Don't you mean in Jesus' name, amen? And he rolled his eyes. Jerry passed away that night. 
At the time, I compared these two men and I thought how awful it was to carry all that baggage, all of those boundaries, all of that anger, all the way up until your last moment. It used to seem totally foreign to me, keeping people out who wanted to help, keeping people away who look different or who I've been taught to distrust. As I have reflected on this scripture from James this week, I realized there is a little bit of Jerry in me. I suspect there is a little bit of Jerry in all of us. Are any among you suffering? You should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. These are amazing and inspiring words, and I know we all take great comfort in prayer. But sometimes, as Protestants, Presbyterians are affectionately known as the frozen chosen, I think perhaps we too have slightly timid boundaries about prayer. We like our prayers quiet and orderly. We pray logically and practically, and that's good. But sometimes I worry, are we missing out just a little because we are afraid? I wonder what types of prayer we see practiced by others that we shun, but that we might really learn from. What about the energetic, fervent prayers of our evangelical brothers and sisters? What about the prayer made more meaningful and more tangible through fasting observed by our Orthodox friends? Or the hours of silent prayer observed together in community by our Quaker cousins in the faith? And what about the idea of anointing lifted up in this and so many other scripture passages? There are so many ways to communicate with our holy parent. And God says that no matter what our situation, we should be conversing with our holy friend. When I began work on this sermon, I had planned to lift up Jerry and Stephen today and to use them as opposites, to encourage us to be like Stephen, and I do still hope His story sticks with you and empowers you too. But as the week moved on, more and more I heard the message, be honest about your own fear, about your own boundaries keeping you from those who would love to share God's love and peace with you. Look at yourself first. Now, I'm not saying that we will be speaking in tongues here next week. But I am saying that I have realized I need to be more open to the moving of the Spirit, even when it comes in unfamiliar or intimidating forms. I do not want to go to my grave sure of the only three ways God works in this world and avoiding all others with rolled eyes and corrections of verbiage. I want to be open to the movement of the Spirit, to the messages of angels on earth walking among us, the assistance that comes from the most unlikely corners and the comfort that is offered even by people that I find uncomfortable. I believe God is so much bigger and so much more powerful than any of us humans can even comprehend. 
and I begin my new year seeking to open myself to the full power, full presence, to the divine offerings of the Holy Trinity in my life and in my world. And I invite you to join me to break free from whatever holds you back from the fullness and the joy of faith. And I invite you to be open to the good surprises that await when we truly believe that God is God, sovereign, omnipotent, all-powerful, and is able to work in so, so many ways, and is able to hear us in so, so many languages and spaces and situations and emotions, friends, this year and always. May it be true for us. Amen. friends, as we come to this time of prayer for ourselves and our community and our entire world, I thought it would be fitting on a Sunday where we speak about prayer and I invite you to perhaps open your horizons a little bit about what prayer might look like for you to use a prayer from our Baptist brothers and sisters. It is entitled, Come Holy Spirit. And let us indeed invite 
the Holy Spirit into our hearts and our minds through this prayer. Ever-living and ever-loving God, we praise you for your loving presence with us. Come, Holy Spirit, take and transform our societies that broken people find healing, that lonely people find love, that bitter people find peace, and fearful people find hope. Come, Holy Spirit. Take our world's leaders and governments and bring renewal, that communication can be open, that relationships between hostile people and hostile nations will evaporate, that a hunger for justice addresses the hunger for food felt by so many. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill your church that our worship will be ever more pleasing to you, that prayers will change our minds instead of trying to get you to change yours, that our lives will make a real difference to real people in the real world. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our lives with your presence so that more and more every day, all that we do and say and hope will be an act of worship to you and an expression of love to others, always and only to the glory of your name. Amen. Friends, I pray that this week your journey of faith is rich and meaningful. I pray that as we leave this time of worship, this time where we are connected and united in the body of Christ, you will remember that you are never alone. You go with the grace of God, the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the power and the passion of the Holy Spirit now and always. Amen.